This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the AIPIS show for accredited income property investment specialists and those who aspire to be. If you're a real estate, mortgage, or financial professional, this is the place for you. We'll explore innovative investment analysis, sales, marketing, and income generating strategies for the most historically proven wealth creator, income property. Learn from the experts as they show you how to build a better business and a better life. It's my pleasure to welcome a returning guest back to the show. He's been on many times. Kerry Lutz runs the Financial Survival Network, and he is an investment counselor. Uh, Kerry, welcome back. How are you doing? Hey, everything is good. I'm just really uh, social distancing myself. I'm saving a fortune. I'm not making anything, but I'm saving so much that uh, <laughs> because, because almost you, coming out even. Because you're not going out and spending money, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I used to buy lunch three, four times a week. Mm-hmm. I'd go out to dinner three or four times, and I'd still like to do it, but mm-hmm. uh, the government has told me that I cannot. So I just have to sit home and uh, join the economic downturn. Yeah, you know, The Economist, which I'm sure is a magazine you, you read to some extent at least, uh, the the cover of The Economist magazine was so fitting. It had a picture of the Earth as seen from outer space with a closed sign hanging <laughs> on it. And it, it's absolutely crazy to me, I still got to mention it, that just a week and a half, maybe it was two weeks ago, Mnuchin said that we may or may not enter a recession. Are you kidding me? You can't close the global economy down and expect not to be in a recession. That that's just absolutely nuts to say something like that. But you're interviewing people all, all the time on your show, Carrie. You know, just what do you make of things? I'll ask you just a very general question. Take it wherever you like. Yeah, well, you can't shut down the global economy even for 90 days and then not expect to have a major recession, if not a global depression. China is opening up now, supposedly. But who are they going to sell their stuff to when all of their markets are closed? So they've been out for three months. Now they have to wait for the rest of the planet to catch up. So they're out for six months. This is the stuff that revolutions are made of because they had kind of a devil's pact with their people. We'll keep the economy growing. We'll keep you fed and clothed and housed. And you just let us do whatever we want and uh, let us do our totalitarian thing. And now that compact, that deal with the devil, is over. And where do we go from here? And when you say that, you're talking about the Chinese people and the Chinese government, uh, yes. their perspective. And and yes, China has always been extremely sensitive to civil unrest because, you know, the promise of communism and socialism is that the people will get their free stuff. And of course, it's not free. You got to work. But centrally planned governments and economies, that's kind of the, the deal they make, Right. But the people have to behave themselves. And this is the stuff revolutions are made of. So China is coming back online uh, to some extent now. It seems though their infections have peaked. And they're, they're going to get back to work here before we do, uh, because the disaster came later to the U.S. and to Europe. Yeah, so they're coming back on, but they got nobody to sell anything to. Orders are being canceled left and right. I mean, the amazing thing is... Uh, well, Amazon supposedly hiring 100,000 more people to sell more Chinese stuff. I just uh, don't know how this is all going to work out, but obviously it's going to really spur nationalism when you see the EU, the countries that comprise the EU, putting border ch- controls back on to keep infected people out. Now, wait and- a sec. I got to just, just comment on that. Imagine that, people. Countries have the right to have borders. Wow. Haven't we been talking about that the last three years as everybody's hating on Trump? You know, <laughs> this is like, I just, oh gosh, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous. So of course, countries have the right to protect their borders. And yes, I do think the world is going to become more isolationist. Yeah. For, for better uh, or worse. Yeah. No doubt. And uh, you look at the 
you know, I know it's been beat to death, but the whole thing with antibiotics in the U.S. production has been outsourced to China. That's obviously going to change. But, you know, we're in a situation here where the world central banks and governments are going to be giving out hurricane uh, helicopter money mm -hmm. and literally dumping money on the people from helicopters. And this is not a good sign. I mean, it could conceivably be the death knell of the uh, the global economic system here. Now, what you mean by that is you mean inflation, possibly hyperinflation, right? Yeah. With it, with that dumping, just you know, you know, you can't create money out of thin air and expect not to ultimately have inflationary pressures. Yeah, you can create money out of thin air, but you can't create wealth out of thin air, um, and that's what distinction. What uh, they fail to uh, get. Because just because the quantity of money goes up, the goods and services that uh, uh, represent the purchasing power of that money are not going up, they're going down. Now, I'm not saying that there's going to be inflation because it could very well turn deflationary. I mean, we look at the stock markets of the world, lost $25 trillion in value. So that's asset deflation. Yes. Yeah. That's, that will translate into lower purchases cutting back on spending and you know people you just have to look at the travel system here the travel network if you will has been totally decimated in six weeks time and it happened so quickly this is such a sharp v-shaped recession you know it looks like they're not going to bail out the cruise ship industry or the cruise industry which by the way i agree with i mean i don't really agree with any bailouts as a you know, yeah. generally philosophically, although, you know, practice and philosophy can differ. And I'll be the first to admit that just from my own perspective. But, you know, these cruise ships have been evading American taxes, yet the U.S. is their biggest market for customers. And, you know, they, they set up offshore and they hire offshore workers and, the, you know, they, they skirt the tax system in the U.S. and then expect a bailout. Give me a break. They don't deserve it. You know, if you if you want to bail out from the U.S. government, then pay into the U.S. government. OK, if you want welfare from the U.S. government, pay into the U.S. government. Uh, otherwise, go get your bailout from the country where your ship is registered or where your where your company is registered. You know, maybe, you know, some of these companies that use the Ireland or the Dutch or the, the Philippine, you know, or that whatever tax haven they're using. Right. They, they can get them to bail them out. You know, see if they see if those countries give them bail out. Yeah, like the Netherlands or yeah. Panama. Right. Yeah, I'm sure Panama is really going to bail out Carnival Cruise Lines. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, look, I go to Boeing and to me and, and all of these industries, the airlines between the airlines and Boeing, they bought back since 2012. And this is according to Wolf Richter, Wolf, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, I think is his his site. They collectively bought back $90 billion of their shares. And Boeing needs $60 billion now. Boeing mm -hmm. had bought back $45 billion worth of their shares. You know, they're in the situation they're in because of bad management. So I had uh, published the taxpayers uh, bailout bill of rights. My feeling is just like in uh, 2008, well, they're letting Boeing's management stay there. The very people who got them there now granted the head mm -hmm. Muhlenberg, he left, but he left with an $80 million golden parachute. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, these, these, so. these companies are scamming the taxpayers left and right. They abuse the system. You know, American Airlines is a great example, right? They made a fortune during the good times. They didn't bother to save any money uh, to speak of. They bought their own stock back, enriching themselves and creating a fake value for their stock. And uh, got other, you know, middle class investors to buy in after the fat cats. And, you know, now they go to the government and say, we need a bailout. Well, where's your savings account? Where's your contingency plan? It's ridiculous. Hey, so, and on that topic, all the while, so Boeing decides to buy back their stock rather than to invest in a successor to the 737, which was a 1960s vintage airframe, which they've maxed out. They've done a great job. They, with they it. really have. They've they've milked that yeah. plane <laughs> for a long but time. It hit, yeah. limit. it hit its limits yeah. with the 737 Max. Now, 10 years ago, 
they had the option of replacing that with a composite frame, much like the 787, and they chose They to didn't want to do the R&D. They, they just yeah. wanted to take the simple approach and do a 737 MAX. Yeah. Right. And then buy back their shares. So what, and we should be specific, when you buy back your company's shares, look at it this way, if you're making $200 and it comes out, you have 100 shares, then it's a dollar a share. But if you only have 50 shares, because you bought back the half of them, then you're making $2 a share, your bonuses get triggered, because they're basing it on earnings per share, rather than the actual profitability of the company and free cash flow, which is the lifeblood of business. And these people walk away the year before Muhlenberg in, uh, I think, 2018, he walked away with 30 million. And this is a guy that destroyed the company. So him and his cohorts on the board and management all did this. They should all be expelled from the company for life. I had a few other things in there, like no moratorium on lobbying any government at any level if you take our money. And other things like bonuses don't get paid, disgorgement of prior bonuses. That have and what, what you're talking about is the taxpayer bill of rights. If the company accepts a bailout, exactly. these should be the rules under. I'm, you didn't really set that up for the listener, I don't think. So. Right. Yeah, yes. I wanted to give them the context of what you're talking about. But no stock buybacks. That's what I say. Uh, that's what Mark yeah, Cuban was and, out saying. Yeah. And it, because from 2012 to now, there were $4.5 trillion worth of stock buybacks. That inflated the stock market and helped put us into mm -hmm. the mess that we are in now. And it should there's no economic justification for buying back your own stock except in the limited situation where your stock is selling for below book value. And then it becomes a good investment to a point. And there's been this orgy of buybacks going on and really – you know, the Bible says in times of uh, peace, you prepare for war. In times of war, you prepare for peace. And, you you know, in times of plenty, you prepare for famine. And in times of famine, you prepare for plenty. They just ignored this basic admonition of the Bible. And it's not religious. Right. It's just common sense. Yeah, it is common sense. Now yeah. they're in a hole. Now they're in a hole. And we got to bail them out. And we, you know, it's not like we're actually going to pay more in taxes. We're just going to have create more currency units to do the job and hope that we don't have major inflation. Well, yeah, which, which of course we ultimately will. It takes a while to work its way through the system. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's really something. Okay, so what's interesting too is that the Federal Reserve is now a bond buyer um, mm -hmm. and it looks like they're probably going to be a stock buyer soon if they get congressional approval. And the Fed is literally going to go into the market, and in addition to buying bonds, which is already kind of crazy, they're going to buy stock. I mean, corporate bonds I'm talking about, they're buying, okay? Yep. So they're going to buy stock in companies to prop up the stock market. Yep, exactly. And that, you know, Trump, before he was president, said the stock market's a bubble. After he's president, he's taking credit for the rising stock market and everyone's portfolio is going higher. Now that it's gone down, it's COVID-19's fault. It's not his. But you can't stake. You live by the uh, stock market. You die by the stock market. Yeah. And you can't blame, you know, if it wasn't COVID-19, it would have been COVID-20. Or it would have been, uh, you know, the Spanish flu 2.0. Yeah, right, 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 or right. or it, it would have been a war or something else. This balloon had to be pricked yeah. by something. And it was just COVID-19 in this case. Let, let's talk about that for a minute. So... Just do a thought experiment with us for a moment, listeners. Uh, let's just assume that the COVID-19 thing, and I'm not saying this, I'm just saying this is a thought experiment. So relax, people. I know some people are believers and they're really worried about it. And, you know, I kind of fall into that camp a little bit. Uh, some people think it's a massive overreaction. It's a fake. It's a conspiracy. It's not really that big a deal. It's like the flu. Okay, so you got these two sides diametrically opposite ends of the spectrum, right? But let's just go with the people who think it's no big deal for a moment, okay? Now, if this thing comes along and, you know, let's assume it's not really that big a deal, okay? But the government 
or governments of the world knowing that they've been totally irresponsible all these years, they've spent too much money, they've inflated these giant bubbles, we're in the everything bubble, and instead of having another great financial crisis like we did last time around, which you know all the corporations and the governments got the blame for that, rightfully so, but of course they nobody got any jail time, no. sadly. Now they get to blame it on coronavirus. So it's a very convenient excuse. And they, they just shut down the economy for a short time and, and say, oh, well, you know, this is the reason we need more control of your lives. We need, we need to pump in money into the system. We need to paper over our sins from the past 12 years or really the last five decades to an extent too. You know, that, that is a, a, this is a convenient time for this to happen because everybody was talking about the bubble popping anyway, right, before this. Yeah, and the whole thing is it's very hard for people to know and appreciate that they're in a bubble when, when they're in, in the bubble. Right. It's only after it pops and you say, oh, that was a bubble. Yeah. But for the people who got it before, uh, they cleaned up. Mm-hmm. And uh, you didn't need to be uh, Nicholas Tlaib to uh, to clean up on this. That's the Black Swan, right? Yeah. The Black Swan book, yeah. Yeah, you know, you could uh, do it in other ways just by various things, by living beneath your means, by investing in assets that uh, are kind of mandatory, like uh, like single family homes, that type of thing, mm-hmm. and in gold, uh, which was the best performing asset for the past year and a half mm-hmm. after what the debacle that took place in the stock market. Kerry, what do you make of all these sudden CEO resignations? And like right at the time that the financial markets finally sort of recognized coronavirus as a real threat, all of these CEOs just resigned their posts. They just, you know, the Disney CEO and a whole bunch of others, they just left. I mean, that that was shocking. Not that many people are really talking about this. Well, did, a lot did, of it, did they see something we didn't or what? A lot of it was the Me Too thing, supposedly. There's probably guys seeing it coming and want to get out at the top. It always makes sense to get out at the top than get out at the bottom. Uh, you know, like Jack Welch. He got out right at the top of uh, GE. Mm-hmm. A couple, three years later, the companies in the dumps. Yeah. Well, and, and even even yeah. the Federal Reserve uh, level too, not just, not just uh, the big corporations – but uh, Alan Greenspan resigned at just the right time. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, they do. But but the question is more of they obviously knew we were at the top. They knew, they must have known something. That's what people are saying. They must have known something that general public didn't know. Obviously, if you're the CEO of a big giant corporation, you have information that you know the hoi polloi doesn't have, right? Uh, yeah. Of course. Yeah, right. right. Course. But, but any any thoughts on that? Well, I don't know what they knew. Eventually, every boom ends with a bust. Mm-hmm. And every bust ends with a boom. Mm-hmm. It's just the way of the financial markets. And you get to a point in your 60s, you start like thinking about other things, about, hey, I've got a limited time left on the planet. There's other things I want to do. I've got to the top of the heap in corporate America. And now, you know, hey, like the old cliche, I want to go spend more time with my family. (laughs) Well, you're getting to spend a lot of time with your family now that everybody's in isolation here, right? (laughs) Right, right. You know, I've, I've wondered if nine months from now, there will be either a mini baby boom or a, a bunch of divorces. <laughs> I don't know which, you know. Or both. <laughs> or both, yeah. yeah. A lot of adoptions. <laughs> yeah. Who, who knows? Who knows what will happen? Well, you said that the end of every bubble ends with a boom. And I think that's true. You know, uh, I like this uh, idea that expansions create millionaires, but recessions create billionaires. And if you look back through every, I mean, we don't have to look back to the Great Depression, okay? We can just look back 10 to 12 years ago to the Great Recession and look at all of the wealth that was created coming out of that. But when when we were in it at the time, and I remember it well because, you know, it wasn't that long ago, 
10 to 12 years ago, it, it felt like the world was ending. It felt like everything was over. I mean, asset prices were just collapsing. It was absolutely monumental and it was much more slow than this has been. This has been very sudden, this, this one, obviously. But look at all of the, the new ideas, the new businesses, the new successes that were created out of that. I wish I had a list of examples. I know they're there okay. because I, I remember thinking about a lot of them over the past 10 to 12 years. A lot of opportunities come out of these times, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, that old cliche, more millionaires were created in the Great Depression than at any other time in history. Yeah. Uh, you know, these trends of various so-called essential industries coming back to the United States, the end of globalism, yeah. will definitely create opportunities that we hadn't seen before. And the other thing is, uh, you know, I always refer to the U.S. dollar as the Taj Mahal of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> meaning, you know, meaning that the dollar isn't that great. It's just better than everything else, right? Is that what yeah, you're saying when you say that? Fact, <laughs> the Taj the Mahal best, of Baltimore. <laughs> Good. Best house in the worst neighborhood, right? right? Got it, got it. And, you know, uh, so the fact is, though, that, uh, that the rising dollar or the stable dollar, it might all come to collapse, but let's assume that it isn't going to because you can't do anything if it is anyway. So let's just assume the dollar will carry on in some way or form and more money is going to pour into the United States as a result. You know, this recession is very predictable. You and I have been predicting it for uh, the past uh, eight, nine years that we've been talking. We knew it was coming and we knew it was going to be bad. And I said for the past decade that the next crash will be far worse than 08 and 09. 08 and 09 was really bad, but this is far worse. Oh, yeah. And, but out of the ashes comes a new world. Mm -hmm. And what you need to do is figure out the trends and get ahead of the trend. Look, this whole working from home thing, uh, what's that going to do to the commercial real estate market? Oh, terrible. Jason? It's just going to collapse in so many ways. Yeah. I mean, Carrie, I think this is and people may disagree with me about this, but I think this is a generational mentality change. I don't mm. think I don't think we will ever go back. I mean, and when I say ever, obviously memories fade eventually, right? But for a generation or at least the better part of 10 years to ho the hotel business being great, the travel business being great, um, mm. concerts, big weddings, even funerals, you know, like yeah. any, everybody has become a germaphobe. And, you, yeah. you know, we probably should have been better germaphobes before. I, I've been on the leading edge of that. I, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe, Same <laughs> here. Know, but, uh, uh, but not, not like this. Now I'm really, no. now I'm really, Trump is really ahead because yeah. he didn't even shake people's hands when I met him, yeah. held off shaking his hand because I knew he was a germaphobe and it went into the bathroom of, by his office, and there was a huge sign on the mirror: "All employees must uh, must wash, scour, yeah. and disinfect their hands uh, oh, really, yeah. before coming back to the office." I, I remember reading that about Trump years ago, oh, before so everybody, Trump. before half the country hated him, um, and, yeah, and, and then, half the and country then loved we him. Leaving, yeah. We shook hands, and yeah. he insisted on shaking hands, but yeah. I didn't uh, push that on him because I knew that that was his thing. Well. Yeah. For one thing, what, what year did you meet Trump? By the way, uh, it was two thousand. Yeah, okay. It was right before nine eleven, okay. and you know now you uh, you you think like just think all these people hand sanitizer. I've got uh, Lysol wipes in my car. I wipe my car down. You you shouldn't you shouldn't tell people that they might break into your car. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm leaving them showing too. Right, hey, yeah. I got to tell you a funny story. So so you know I'm single and I do date, but. Dating's kind of been on hold because there's no place to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one woman who I've been friendly with for a while, we had a date yesterday. We went to Sam's Club. Mm -hmm. And the highlight of the date that was... That was her there, date, Sam's Club. Okay. Yeah, there was... Well, we bought discount gasoline first. Mm -hmm. It's really cheap because gas is going down the drain. Right. Uh, no pun intended. O oil, meaning, yeah. Oil, oil prices yeah. Are, oil. oil prices are so cheap. It's yeah, like petrol. less than half the price you need to have the oil industry come back. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a puzzle. disaster. Yeah. And, and then we went in there, and there was toilet paper, forty-five rolls for uh, twenty bucks, and there was uh, paper towels. So this was like a bonanza date. It was a whole different way of relating, of courting, if you will, uh, 
interacting on a date that's, you know, it was actually a lot of fun. I didn't have to drop hundreds of dollars. We didn't have any wine. We didn't, you know, maybe we picked up a hot dog there, mm -hmm. but that was it. It was like a whole different way. And I think that the way society relates to each other, look, Jason, in mm -hmm. our area here, mm -hmm. I get this thing called spotcrime.com. Mm -hmm. And normally there'd be five or six incidents per day, yeah. you know, mostly minor thefts from people's yards and stuff sure. like bicycles yeah. and yeah, yeah. Uh, no major crime. But yeah. now everyone's home. There's virtually no crime I, in I, the neighborhood I, any longer. I, I, was, I was thinking about that. I was thinking this would be a terrible era in which to be a burglar because everybody's <laughs> home. <laughs> right. Well, you could, you could obviously rob a commercial building because nobody's there. So I guess... You could go in and, you know, if you wanted to break into an office and steal yeah. something, you'd probably be fine. A <laughs> little more generally, well, retail establishments, a little more mm -hmm. fortified, but the opportunity yeah. exists. Yeah. But because nobody's on the street, right? Like, you see the traffic, the traffic's turned, it's disappeared. Yeah. Hey, man, we don't need more highways. We just need a worse economy. And we got all the highways we need. And so anybody that's on the highway stands out like a sore thumb. Right. And, and then I think... Also, we have collective shock mm -hmm. that has set upon the country and the world. And when you're kind of in shock, you don't really do much. And if that if your productivity is being a burglar or a criminal, your pro productivity has gone way down lately. So all those things form. Just look in our neighborhood here. People walking around. Yeah. Always had people walking around and biking. But not, not like now. Yeah. And, and you stop and talk to your neighbor. I know. Yeah. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of, it's, it's very different. It's different. Yeah. That's a great thing, too. Yeah, it is. Uh, we're so disengaged and disconnected from the people living 20, 30 feet away from us. Right. And that's been a real negative of technology mm -hmm. and of, uh, of the suburban sprawl mm -hmm. and other other factors. Okay. And, and I, I, got, I got to ask you a question about that suburban sprawl. Okay. Look at um, you are from New York. Now you lived in Westchester County, but I believe there was a time when you also lived in Manhattan, right? Yes. Okay. So the big uh, trend that I've been predicting is that after this blows over and it will, there is going to be a major mindset shift and people are going to start moving to less densely populated areas yes. uh, that are safer. The suburban, I think we're going to see the rise of suburbia. I really think suburbia right. is coming back. I, I don't think rural areas, I mean, some will obviously, but but suburban is a good choice. You can socially distance, you know, people are going to be worried about the next pandemic because another one will come after this. You know, it's just the way of things. Yeah, well, the places that have been hit worst by the pandemic, mm -hmm. and that's not just this one, all are the most densely populated places, yeah. which also happen to be like New York and the major metropolitan areas. And, and LA they, and San Francisco. Yeah. And guess what's coming next? The new hotspot is New Orleans. Oh, well, yeah. you know, that place uh, yeah, it's has a been mess. Sinking, right. yeah. uh, in more ways than one yeah. for a hundred years. Yeah. But, you know, you look at it, all of the cities, states, et cetera, that are hit the worst, especially New York, are people with the states with the highest population density, uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the country mm -hmm. and, and has the most densely populated city in the country, which I believe, I think I remember it being Hoboken, but I could be wrong, most densely populated city in the country. And then you look in China where it's spread like wildfire. It's so super dense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Italy is very dense. I mean, European cities are very dense. Suburbia, yeah. the idea of suburban living is a uniquely American idea. And the reason that is true is because post-World War II, the baby boomers got busy and there was this huge development boom and they just, the sprawl began in post the post-World War II life. And that's what created suburbia. And then there was, of course, the famous Levitt town which Levitt is like, that, yes. like the suburban model, right? And America had the automobile. And the you know we have this romance with the car in this country. And that's why we have suburbia. European countries, uh, you know, China, no other country really has a suburban 
concept in the way America does. And that's a great opportunity for real estate investors. Oh, so, yeah. totally. Especially with the price of energy coming down. Yeah. And the, understand the energy prices have been coming down in inflation adjusted terms for a long time. Oh, yeah. So it's just a continuation of the trend. And look, uh, I don't know about you, but driving much less. So uh, finding things in your neighborhood to entertain you and to mm -hmm. connect with people right. is really a great thing. Yeah. And it's, it's a, like a hidden gem that we've all forgotten about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea, like when you used to move to a new neighborhood and the neighbor had the welcoming committee, right. there was yeah. a credit check on you, but they yeah. didn't talk about that. <laughs> uh, but it's the point different. is, yeah. it was a great thing. They brought you a cake and you felt like you were part of something. Mm -hmm. We've gotten away from that. And that's also the family. So this might be a, a real buildup for the family as well, because we're not out there trying to acquire everything. So the age of acquisitiveness acquisition right. uh, maybe is uh, is going to diminish substantially. Consumerism. And maybe go back to where we were in the 50s, which wasn't so bad. Yeah, right. No, I, hey, listen, I agree. I think there's a lot of good stuff that will come out of this. The message for listeners, though, is you've got to look at Things are moving around. Whenever this happens, wealth moves around. Things move around. Uh, certain industries die. Other industries are born. You know, certain investments really suffer and certain investments thrive. So that's what we're here to help you with. Carrie, uh, give out your website. Oh, sure. It's uh, And just let me make one sure. comment before we uh, wrap up. It's financialsurvivalnetwork.com. I started it in 2011. I was getting ready to rebrand because I'm saying, you know, I'm just not relevant anymore. Right. Now you've got a great name. Money yeah. has jobs. Yeah. And literally, I was a few, maybe a month away from a total rebrand. Uh -huh. And here we are, Jason. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, I'm keeping the name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think the name is good. You know, for years during the Great Recession, my number two podcast of all the different shows that I run was the Holistic Survival Show. And the tagline is protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. And for the past 10 years, times have been pretty certain. Everybody's yeah. uh, partying and spending and everything, you know, looks good and rosy. But now that show has come back into popularity. So the Holistic Survival it. Show is uh, is now gaining ground, and I think your your name is perfect. For you know, eventually, uh, narrow ties come back into style. Eventually, the wide ties come back into yep. style. You and I are back in style here. That's Jason. right. Yeah. We're, <laughs> not that we were ever out, but, you know, it's a huge drag to rebrand your show and your website and everything, oh, and yeah, I really yeah. didn't want to do it. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, my, my last parting message is, don't let this thing get you down. Mm -hmm. It's like a depression isn't just an economic depression. It is a mental state shared by the majority of the participants in society. And you can decide whether or not you're going to participate. There's a lot of good things, a lot of hopeful things. I mean, my son's been living with me for the past two and a half weeks. It's been great. We kind of reconnected and mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's out there uh, in the world making his way. But you know, it's, it's been a great experience and I'm grateful for it. Yeah, no, there are lots of good things that come out of this. So thanks for sharing all this, Carrie, and be well, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Jason. Always great to come on the show. Happy investing. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, heartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.